So as you all may or may not already be well aware, every year we at Georgia Organics create a campaign to celebrate National Farm to School Month and to encourage kids to grow, cook, eat, and learn about a fruit or vegetable. With all of the learning taking place outside of schools lately due to the pandemic, we've decided to turn up the volume on sensory education to encourage teachers, parents, community members, and those who may have unexpectedly found themselves in the role of educator this year to enjoy some non-screen time sensory-based learning. So today we are going to introduce you to Farm to School and show you how easy and experiential learning can be. We will enjoy some hands-on lessons with fruits and vegetables, including doing a taste test together virtually. We'll share a lot of different resources with you so that you will be set up to use these fun standards-based lessons in your education program this month and beyond. All right, hopefully you all got an email from me giving you a heads up that you would be needing a few materials today. We're going to have a lot of fun learning and doing together. And to get the most out of your time with us today, we have encouraged you to bring a raw fruit or vegetable, washed, cut, and ready for tasting. You'll also need a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil to write with. So hopefully you've got these materials already or hopefully you can quickly and easily get them if you don't or just use your imaginations and note how easy setup can be for hosting a sensory learning experience with your students. All right. So I haven't introduced myself yet. I am Kimberly Kugler, the Farm to School Coordinator at Georgia Organics. And to guide us through the Farm to School activities we'll be doing today is Jenna Mobley and I will let her introduce herself now. Hi, I'm Jenna Mobley. I have been a public school teacher for 12 years now, primarily in Atlanta Public Schools. I started in fourth grade. I've also taught first grade and second grade. And now I work with a lot of different nonprofits across the state and across the country on building curriculum and doing teacher trainings for this type of work that brings food into the classroom. Before we get rolling, we'd also like to hear a little bit about who is here with us today. So in the chat box, if you will take a moment to introduce yourself, let us know where you are in Georgia or beyond and what setting you teach in. Take a moment to put those answers into the chat box. I can't wait to see where everyone is joining us from. We'll get rolling on exactly what Farm to School is and start to get our hands in on learning. Kimberly, will you share with us what Farm to School is? Oh, yes. Sorry, I was getting distracted by reading everybody's. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> so excited yes. to meet everyone. So, yeah, maybe Farm to School is kind of new to you. So what is this abstract concept of Farm to School? Um, at Georgia Organics, we believe that the best farm to school programs are comprehensive programs that include activities in the classroom, the cafeteria, and the community. Hands-on activities like cooking, taste testing, and gardening are fun ways for students to learn Georgia educational standards and the impact of food choices on their health, their community, and the local economy. When local food is purchased and promoted, nutrition education lessons can be reinforced at the same time that local farmers are supported. Involving your local farmers, either by inviting them to schools or by bringing students to farms, can make community connections and bring food and agriculture systems education to life. Inviting community members to support and celebrate farm to school programs, build awareness and support throughout the district. Training 
teaching staff to integrate food and agriculture in curriculum and training cafeteria staff to, pre to prepare and promote local food empowers the entire school to create the best farm to school program that works for them. Finally, including a commitment to farm to school and district wellness policies and state policies ensures that farm to school will support students, community members, and farmers for the long term. So that's kind of the lengthy comprehensive definition that this infographic that you can see here is meant to depict. Um, for today's purposes, all you really need to know is that farm to school is buying locally grown foods when possible to feed and teach students, teaching lessons using local foods and doing the hands-on garden and food-based education that we're all going to explore together today. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back over to Jenna now. You're in good hands with Jenna. Take it, take it from here. All right, so we wanted to start off not only by welcoming you all here and doing some introductions to hear who's in the room, but by also mentioning that this work is for everyone and is not just for traditional teachers in the classroom, especially in the times that we find ourselves in. This work of connecting children with food is done by so many different members of our community. This work is for not only teachers and homeschool teachers, but maybe pod leaders or tutors or after school caregivers or babysitters or parents, anyone that is connected with children. This is who this workshop is for and this is who this work is for. And we welcome all of you to this workshop. All right, so we'll start off with why we would even, why we would even teach through food. And there are so many reasons. And I think we all come to this work in a lot of different ways. I personally came to this work through being a academic public school teacher, trying to teach the standards in a way that could connect with my kids, that they could all get excited about. And you can see in this picture here how exciting this strawberry was. When he picked this strawberry, it, we had that innate curiosity and excitement and engagement where all of a sudden my students were interested and engaged and learning about the plant life cycle and how many strawberries and doing math with our strawberries. These were real life situations that they were hands on that were way different than inside the classroom working with a worksheet with a hypothetical strawberry. Another reason to teach through food is that I found very quickly that there were huge improvements in my students health and their physical health. And we know about children and adults that the more familiar they are with fruits and vegetables, the more willing they are to try those and the more likely they are to like those fruits and vegetables. So this is one of my kids, Rodolfo. And after we had grown lettuce from seed in our garden all season long, we had measured the lettuce, we'd harvested the lettuce, we made a salad dressing for the lettuce. And for one of our activities, we wrote a persuasive essay about lettuce. Now his persuasive essay was to our principal asking to have more lettuce on the cafeteria lunch line. Now, I don't think that the reason we had lettuce on the cafeteria lunch line had anything to do with this lettuce, to be clear, with his letter, to be clear. But regardless, the next week there was lettuce on the cafeteria lunch line and Rodolfo was the first one to fill up his entire tray full of lettuce because now he knew where it come from, how special this miracle of this little seed was that grew into this plant that then was on his lunch line. And he actually got in trouble that day because he didn't have room to put his milk cart, which I thought was kind of funny, but that goes to show how this can change those attitudes. It's also important to teach through food and teach through the outdoors for our students' mental health. A lot of my students that struggled inside the classroom, indoors, with any of our screen learning, really thrived when we got outdoors. When they had an opportunity for their fine motor development to sort little seeds and their gross motor development to climb these trees and use a wheelbarrow to get some of that energy out, some of those sensory processing skills, they were able to focus and focus in on the academic content because they were out there moving their bodies and breathing the fresh air. We also teach through food because this teaches students to love their environment. They have to notice their environment before they can love it and they have to love it before they are willing to protect it. So we are building a generation of students that will protect this environment in this world that we live in that grows our food. Food also connects us to our families and our cultures. 
These are just a couple of the emails and photos that I've received from parents that said, you know, all of a sudden my kid is interested in going to the grocery store with me and helping me shop. Or all of a sudden my kid helped me make this pie that my mom used to make for me in our home country where we came from. Or I couldn't believe that my student came home and wanted to help me make a salad and a salad dressing to share with the family. And those are sort of the unique connections and bonds that we can create through food. And again, this just continues these sort of life skills is learning how to use a knife and how to measure and how to create something beautiful and delicious to share with our friends and family is really powerful, even for just young kids to be able to have that sort of ownership and be able to give that gift of food to the people around them. There are so many reasons why we would embed food into the way that we connect with children and the way that we teach with children. Sorry, am I supposed to take it from here? This yes. Is, yeah. <laughs> All right, so how can Georgia Organics support you in your farm to school work? Um, we, one of the things that we do is we send out a monthly electronic newsletter called the eBite. In it are grant opportunities, resources, news, any, any and all, all the greatest and latest of Farm to School. Uh, we also, every year, as I mentioned before, uh, coordinate a statewide campaign to celebrate National Farm to School Month. Happy Duran. And then we um, provide workshops and trainings like this one. So this year, our National Farm to School Month campaign is called Turn Up the Volume. Every year we've done lettuce and spinach, all sorts of different things. And today, this month, it is turnips. And we're so excited to share with you all sorts of different facts and recipes and lessons and activities that all have to do with turnips and connecting our kids with this really interesting vegetable and giving them these new unique experiences that will connect them to a vegetable that is grown right here in their home state on the soil that they share with all of us. So let's dig in and try some of these lesson plans. We are going to start with exploring new foods. So some of these we are going to do together as a class, as if you guys are all my students in my virtual classroom. And first, let's see, I'm gonna turn off my screen sharing so I can show you what our mystery vegetable is that you have no idea what it is because I have not mentioned it yet. This is our mystery vegetable of the day, students. All right, now let's go back to our presenter view so you can see the questions that we are going to answer about this mystery vegetable. So when you look at this vegetable, and there's no right or wrong answers here in the chat box, tell us where have you seen a vegetable like this before? Or where do you think you've seen a vegetable like this before? What does it look like? What does it remind you of? Does it remind you of anything else that you've had before? Have you seen it? in your classroom, in the school cafeteria, maybe your school garden, maybe a restaurant, the grocery store, the farmer's market, at home, um, at your friend's house, at your aunt's house. Do you think you've tasted it before? What do you remember about this vegetable? In the chat box, write some ideas of what this reminds you of. If you've seen this before, what experiences you've had with this before. All right, we are going to move through some more of our prompts. With kids, of course, we wouldn't do all of these, but I wanna give you an idea of all the different ways that we can connect with this vegetable with our students. So here's our next one, is what shapes do you see in this vegetable? What shape would you see if you sliced this vegetable? So these are our 3D and our 2D shapes. So our 3D shape, this is like a sphere when we're looking at this root part of the vegetable. This visualization part of what shape would we see if we slice this vegetable is very tricky for kids, but that is one of the reasons that we do prepare food and do knife skills with kids because this turning this 3D shape into a 2D face is one of our standards that's hard to grasp without a lot of practice. So if we slice this, we would see a circle. 
about how long do we think this is or about how long do we think the leaves are? We can do some estimation with length and then we could pull out our ruler and actually find out how long it is or use non-standard units of measurement like about how many of our thumbs long are these leaves. We can also talk about about how much does this weigh. We might have a scale or maybe we could compare it. Does it weigh about as much as our wavy cutter? Is it lighter or heavier? All of these math standards, just exploring this turnip. Right, and then we can do, this is one of the kids' favorite ones. You know, division sounds really tricky. Multiplication, division, those are like third to fifth grade level skills. But even kindergartners are pros at sharing things equally, right? We know this for sure. They know how to share food equally. So I'm going to turn off my screen so you can see some of these different math problems that we can do today. If I'm not already pinned, make sure that my face is pinned so you can see here. All right, let's do a little bit of math with these turnips that Snap Finger Farm donated to us. So if we have eight turnips in this bundle and eight turnips in this bundle, Type into the chat box, how many turnips do we have total? That is two groups of eight or two times eight. There's one of our math problems. All right, let's take a look at some of these loose turnips. If we wanted to share these two turnips with let's say four of my friends, me and my three colleagues here, Kimberly, Kimberly and Ashley, how can we divide one, two, three, four, five, six turnips between four people. Six divided by four. One for me, one for Kimberly, one for Ashley, one for Kimberly. One for me, one for, oh, wait a second. We don't have an even amount. So if we did six turnips divided between four students, we would each get one with a remainder of two turnips. Depending on the grade level, you could Stop there. Or you could say, okay, if we have two turnips, how do we divide two turnips between four students? And your students may be able to figure out whether or not they could do the arithmetic on paper. They may be able to figure out that if you cut these in half, each student will get an additional half because one half plus one half plus one half plus one half, four halves equals two holes. So then if you divide them in that way, each student gets one and one half turnips. So that is pretty complicated math, but even our youngest students with real tangible things that they would like to share equally, they have a vested interest in sharing these equally, can come up with informal multiplication and division strategies to solve complicated problems. And they can use their fractions and what they've learned in their math to solve these problems in this way. All right, now if you have a vegetable in front of you, if you are able to bring your materials with you, now is the time to grab it. You will need your own vegetable in front of you, hopefully a turnip or whatever you have for these next activities. All right, with any vegetable that we taste together, we always start with our senses and we'll come back around to our senses. We are not going to taste this vegetable yet, but Look at our chart here and you'll see what, which of our senses we are going to use first. First, we are going to use eyesight. What do we see? What colors do you see? What color green? It's not just green. Does it remind you of something else that's green? And this is white. Sometimes turnips can be purple. What does it feel like? The leaves specifically have a really interesting texture. What does it smell like? If you smell your vegetable, what could you compare that smell to? What does it remind you of? Where else have you smelled something like that? And now let's talk about how our vegetable may have grown. So for our young kids, a lot of the way that we can start this understanding is about some vegetables that grow up, some that grow down, and some that grow all around. So for this, please stand up where you are. Make sure that my picture is pinned. So you can see the motions and this is how we would do this activity with kids. I have this book that is called Up, Down, and Around. And while I read this book, Up, Down, and Around, when you hear the word up, 
Stretch all the way up. When you hear the word down, fold all the way down. And when you hear the word around, twist all the way around. Everyone can stand up and get ready. Now, while we are learning about which vegetables grow up, down, and around, also be looking for vegetables that are similar to our turnip. So we could get some clues to find out if this turnip grows up, down, or around. Let's get started. In the dirt, we'll dig a row, drop some seeds, and watch them grow. Dirt piles up, seeds go down, water splashes around and around. Corn grows up, carrots grow down, cucumbers climb around and around. Peppers grow up, Potatoes grow down. Pumpkins vine around and around. Broccoli grows up. Beets grow down. Green beans wind around and around. Now wait a second. This one looks a lot like our vegetable today. This one is called a beet. It also has a root and has leaves that come up just like our turnip. So maybe our turnip grows down just like beets. Now we could continue that whole book and that whole lesson, but I'm going to zoom forward and show you what the rest of these lessons could look like in this set. This lesson two is part of our Turn Up the Volume lesson set. When you sign up to be a part of Turn Up the Volume, you are going to have access to tons of these different lesson plans and activities and links to all of these different resources. This lesson, the up, down, and around lesson, also comes with a scavenger hunt that looks like this, where students can show what they eat or what they grow that grows up, down, and around. And of course, on down here, we should have our turnips. Also, in our turn up the volume lesson plans, we go a little bit further. For students that are then learning the plant parts and the vocabulary around roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds. And we use this book, The Vegetables We Eat by Gail Gibbons. Now in this book, we can also look through each of these different types of vegetables until we find one that looks like our mystery vegetable. And here we are, we are on the root vegetables. And if we look around, a lot of these have the same shape and the leaves on the top, we can see how they grow down in the dirt. And here are our turnips here. We can see the different colors that turnips can be too. Now in the lesson set in Turn Up the Volume that includes the Scale Gibbons book, The Vegetables We Eat, you have access to a PDF of these different verses for a song called Roots, Stems, Leaves, Flowers, Fruits, and Seeds. And you will have access to that song and how you can sing that song with your students about every single different one of the plant parts and not only what are examples of those plant parts, but what the purpose of that plant part is for the plant. So you have access to each of these to print out to sing that song. You'll also have access to these cards that we've created with lots of different fruits and vegetables so that children can do a matching game to match what plant part we eat and a lot of our common fruits and vegetables. And in the lesson set, you will also have a chart where students can fill in what they have eaten or what they saw at the farmer's market or what they are growing. That is an edible fruit, seed, leaf, flower, root, or stem, just like this. Those are all ways to explore vegetables before we even eat them, is what plant parts do we see here? And we see this little root here. This looks like it might be the part that's under the soil that maybe drinks all the water. And then these parts are the stems and the leaves that get the sunlight and breathe in the air like this. Anything we can do to connect this that we are going to eat to something that grows out of the ground, even if the students didn't grow it themselves. Okay, the slides here, you'll have access to the PowerPoint later. The slides here will show you exactly what these turn up the volume lesson plans look like so you can find them amongst all of the resources. And here is a peek at what all of the um, vegetables we eat lesson plans look like as well. 
So before we eat, there are a couple of different contemplations that I like to do with kids to just bring our awareness to what we're about to eat and some of our gratitude to what we are going to eat. And it's really quite amazing when you're looking at this brand new vegetable that maybe these kids have never tasted before and they're sort of, they're getting to know it, they're using their senses, they're looking at it in different ways to think about how it grew. It's kind of neat to think with kids and like this started as a seed that was teeny tiny. And then with this combination of soil and sun and water and air, it turned into this that we can eat. That is pretty amazing. And to take a moment to sort of take that all in with kids is really special. So this is the contemplation that I say out loud with my kids in my class. There we go. Can you hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up? All right, perfect. This is one of the contemplations that I do with the kids in my class. If you will make sure that you are on mute, we can say it all together. It says, this food is a gift of the whole universe, the earth, the sky, the rain, and the sun. Now, another contemplation that we like to think about is not only did this vegetable come from this amazing combination of just soil and water and air and sunlight, but there were a lot of humans. There were people that helped bring this vegetable. And sometimes we know who those humans are. For example, with these turnips, this was Raul from Snap Finger Farm that planted that seed, cared for that seed, watered it, weeded around it, waited till it was ready to harvest. He harvested this turnip for me, and then he packed it up in a crate. And then Jake, who works with Raul, drove it to my house and left it on my porch. This is a true story. This actually happened to bring these turnips to me, and I have immense gratitude for not only the sun and the soil and the water and the air, but also all of these people that brought this food to us. Now, we might not always know the answer to this, but taking a moment, to imagine who it might have been, even if we got ours at the grocery store, who it was that planted that seed and took care of it and loaded it in the truck and the grocery store clerks that put it on the shelves and that checked us out and who bought that food for us. Having a moment of gratitude for that can also enhance our experience of this vegetable. So this next contemplation comes from the book you see here that says, that's called Before We Eat by Pat Brisson. And we just read together the first two pages. So if you'll make sure you're on mute, we can read these ones together also. As we sit around this table, let's give thanks as we are able to all the farmers we'll someday meet that helped grow this food we eat. All right, we can also appreciate these new foods that we're eating, these new turnips, these scary turnips that we've never seen before, by thinking about how they can nourish our bodies. So we eat these fruits and vegetables because they help us become more healthy. Now this is sort of a tricky concept for kids, so I'm gonna show you real quickly the book that I love to share when it comes to health. This one is called Good Enough to Eat. And what I love about this book is that it shows this big picture idea of if we eat a lot of different fruits and vegetables, we'll get a lot of different vitamins and nutrients and a lot of different parts of our body will be taken care of. So we leave this up on our bulletin board often, not to memorize exactly the percentage of our daily value of vitamin C that's in each one and try to add up the percentages or anything like that, just to remind us that if we eat a variety of these different foods, we'll get a variety of these different vitamins and nutrients. So we have another contemplation that gets at that same idea. This is our last contemplation, our third one before we eat. So if you're on mute, you can say it with me. This food gives us the energy to be happy, healthy, loving, and understanding. All right, it is really almost time to taste. So if you are at home with your fruit or vegetable that you've been doing all of these different um, activities with, make sure you have a bite-sized piece cleaned up and ready to go. I'm going to show you real quickly how I'm going to get my turnip cleaned up and ready to go. We do have an entire webinar on how to um, do these sort of hands-on cooking lessons with kids. But for now, I want to give you a quick peek. Here is my cutting board and I have my turnip right here. We could use this nylon knife and we'll learn about these knife skills and how to use this safely with children in our other webinar. But today I'm actually going to use this wavy cutter. With this wavy cutter, with a downward motion, this works like a simple machine, like a wedge here. 
he can cut off that little tail. That can go in the compost and cut off these leaves. Now these leaves we will keep because turnip green leaves are also really yummy to eat. But today we are going to be eating this root. Now one of the tricks with cutting any fruit or vegetable is that we want the flat side to go down and we want to use a claw to hold on to our fruit and vegetable or a bridge cut to hold on to our fruit and vegetable as we cut it. Today we are going to put the flat side down. We're going to do a claw and this downward motion will make us a slice of our turnip. And same thing again. And we could continue. So here's my little bite-sized piece that I am going to taste today, just a raw turnip. And if you are at home with yours, get yours ready. Okay, we are going to count to the count of three, and then we are all going to taste together. Now, after we taste together, we are going to take a moment of silence to just think about what that experience is like, and then we'll talk about all the different ways that we can connect with ourselves and with each other about what we experience. All right, get your bite ready. One, two, three. All right, get ready in the chat box again, because I'd love to hear what you think, what your opinion is about what you just tasted. Now, there's a lot of ways to express our opinion. We could say, we liked it, we loved it, it's delishable, delectable, so appetizing, my favorite. You could say any of those things. But, you know, not everything is our favorite. So there's a lot of other sentence frames that we can provide children with. Some healthy sentence frames about how they can express their opinion in an appropriate way. So maybe you could say, I don't care for it yet, but I know my taste buds are always changing, so maybe I'll try it again later. Or it's not my favorite, maybe I would try a different variety. We know that all varieties taste different. Maybe I'll try it again later. Maybe I'd like it prepared differently. Maybe I'd like it with a dip or a dressing. Right in the chat box, what did you think, what is your opinion of what you tasted? Did you like it today? Is there a way that you would like to try it differently or a different variety that you would like to try? These are great. These are great examples of how we can give kids and adults lots of different options and sentence frames beyond nasty and disgusting and fake barfing noises and all of that that we know kids give us all the time, but giving them lots of appropriate ways to share their, the gray scale in between like it or don't like it. There's a lot in between there. So let's talk about more language that we can use. With our younger kids, we can start talking about our adjectives. We can name some adjectives and get a thumbs up or a thumbs down for how these connected with their experience. Was what you tasted sweet? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Mine wasn't really. Was it crunchy? Mine was. Was it soft? I'll put a thumbs in the middle on that one. Yeah, so with our young kids, we can give the language and allow them to show their gradients of agreement for the language. With our older kids, we can provide a word bank, a bigger, deeper, more complex word bank. And we might even divide this word bank and all of these adjectives into both taste and texture as two different experiences. And something that's interesting about this is that we're again giving children the language to describe their experience, not I didn't like it, but what was it that you didn't like? Like it was a little too sour for me. I might like it if it was sweeter. I would like it if it was crunchier. It was a little too mealy. We're giving them this way to look at this fruit or vegetable in a lot of different dynamics, a lot of different ways that they could appreciate it or that they could change it with different varieties or different preparation techniques. Now for our next activity that we're going to do together, on that piece of paper with that pencil, or you did in the chat box here too, jot down as many of these adjectives for our next activity. You're going to want as many adjectives as you can. 
that describe both the taste and texture that you experience. Or if you didn't taste something at home, the taste and texture of a um, fruit or vegetable that you are familiar with, that you've tasted so many times that you could describe, or a turnip like I'm doing here. Another couple of things that you can think about to add to your list that you're writing is maybe not only the taste and the texture adjectives, but also is there, going back to our five senses, did it smell like something specific? What did you see when you bit into it? Did you see a different color? All of these different senses, all of these different words we're going to use for our next activity. Take just a moment to write it in the chat or write it down on your piece of paper. Okay, now on your piece of paper, we're going to make an acrostic poem together. So on the side of your paper, write the fruit or vegetable that you tasted. So you can see the example here on my screen. If you tasted turnips, you would write a T-U-R-N-I-P-S down the side of your paper with space to fill in that line. Then you can use all of those adjectives, those tasting words, those texture words, anything that you saw, anything that you felt, anything that you smelled, and start to fill them in here. See if you can fill in some of your words on your acrostic poem. If you need more ideas, you can also check out the word bank that is here. Now with kids, I would give this one little section at a time. I'm showing you here on the screen the resources that are available to you through the Turn Up the Volume lesson plan resources. But these might be words that you write on the board just a couple at a time, maybe doing that gradients of agreement, the thumbs up, the thumbs down. You could cross out the ones that don't work. You could circle the ones that do work to create a word bank that describes this experience that you had together before you start to fill it in matching these different letters. So even our youngest kids can match the letters. If we give them the words that they chose, they can match to the letter T, U, R, N, I, P, or S. Then we could also challenge students to think beyond just the taste and the texture and the look. We have those here, two lots of words that describe the color, but to maybe add adverbs to the front so this is a more advanced skill for some of our um, maybe third and fourth grade students learning more advanced parts of speech beyond just adjectives. But adding an adverb in front of one of our adjectives gives us lots of other options for what we can add into our acrostic puzzle. We could say that turnips are often crunchy. Or that, I mean, that wouldn't fit into our turnips acrostic poem, so that would not help us because there's not an O in the word turnips. But we could add in any of these always, exactly, perfectly, sometimes, usually, very, any of those words we could add in front. And then after that prompt, we can just give students the opportunity to fill in with any other words or sentences they can think of. So I'd love to see some of the acrostic poems, even if they're not finished. And we can do a gallery walk. And what I like to do with my students in my virtual classroom is encourage the students to put their Zoom onto gallery view so they can see a lot of different students at once. And if we're doing an art project or a writing project or something like that, we can all hold them up together so we can see what each of us has created. Now this might be true. I didn't tell you in advance that we were gonna do this gallery walk. It might be just scribble on a post-it note, which is okay. But I wanna show you what this looks like. If you are teaching in a virtual classroom, as many of us are, I have delivered turnips to all of my students. I have taught my students in the exact same way that I am teaching you right now. All of this work is possible where everyone has their own sensory experience. 
even if we're doing it in this virtual world for a little while. So I want to show you what this looks like to do a gallery walk. If you have a poem to show, even if it's incomplete, show us just like this. Now I encourage my students to show us, but also show their face, not just because I want to see your faces, but also because that lets you see everyone else's. So you can do a gallery walk just like you are in an art gallery. Look at this. These are great. Oh, Kimberly was eating grapes. This is wonderful. All right. So now in the chat box, if we have one or two brave poets out there that would like to share, maybe not even all of theirs, but if you'll tell us what you ate and give us a phrase that matched one of the letters and what you ate. So you could say apples and your phrase could be pretty to look at with one of the P's. <laughs> While you're doing this in the chat box, I will read to you my turnips example here. For turnips, said they grow in the fall, in October. They have underground roots. We talked about that with the plant parts. They're round. We did that with our geometry in our math lesson. Nice and crisp. I'd like them pickled. I added a pronoun there at the front to get that I. They have a purple top using that sense of sight, and they are so delicious. Thank you, Mariah. She, Mariah was eating olives and they are salty. That is a great adjective. All right, so let's go back to our slideshow and I'll show you some of the other literacy lessons that we can do with students. So here's a peek again at what this resource looks like for you to do with your students. One of the other poetry resources that we have is a lesson about creating haikus. So syllables is one of those academic standards that can be sort of boring to teach. And you know, you clap it out. But oftentimes, this is another example of when kids are like, but why do I need to know? Why do I need to know how many syllables are in a word? Well, as a first grade phonics teacher, I have a real answer for that. But also, the other reason why you need to know how many syllables are in a word is because you can create haikus. A haiku is a poem based around how many syllables each phrase has. So the first line has five syllables, the second line has seven syllables, and the third line has five syllables again. And so again, we may as a class or as individuals have created this huge word bank. And it, these aren't just words off a worksheet. These are words that we experience, that we put together. We're using a real experience to inform this literature lesson. And then we're going to work on putting those together and the syllables to equal five, seven, and five. Now in this resource, you will have this frame that you can print out for your students. You'll also have a set of many different examples of different haikus. So this is a broccoli haiku. It says broccoli, so green, sauteed, roasted, steamed, or raw, any way tasty. That is one of the examples. There are many more on there and it's really fun to see what the kids can come up with. We also have, oh, just tons more of these literature lessons. Um, I love all of my books. I'm gonna take you off screen share again so I can show you one of my favorite books that is included here. You can see here, we've included lots of different literature books, both informational but also narrative books about turnips and the turnip the volume lesson set. This one is called Grandma Lena's Big Old Turnip. It's one of my favorites. You'll see that and turn up the volume. You will also see an opportunity for students to write their own informational pieces about turnips with a topic and details. They also will have the opportunity to write their own narratives about turnips, where a turnip is actually the character. So what I like to do is give them this turnip and put two little googly eye stickers on it so they can really imagine it as, as a character. This is their character. And then that character is going to have a setting and a plot, a beginning, middle, and end. It also can give them this, uh, lesson plan also gives them the opportunity to write persuasively about turnips, to come up with an opinion, and then to support that opinion with three different reasons. So all of these lesson plans around these different types of writing for poetry, narrative, informational, and persuasive writing 
are written for the different age groups. You will see these repeated in kindergarten through second grade, third grade through fifth grade, and then up into middle school. These different standards and these different mind maps you'll see are created for those individual levels so that our younger kids can still write each of these different types of writing in a simpler way, while our older kids can write an entire informational paragraph or essay and expand on these ideas, or they can actually send off their persuasive letter to see if they can make any change or get any action with their opinion that was supported by their different reasons. All of these lesson plans for all of these different age levels are in your Turn Up the Volume lesson plan resources for you. All right, so we are going to move on to some of the other parts of Farm to School. We really honed in on taste testing today so that we could all experience a taste test of a new fruit or vegetable and in all the different ways that we can look at that fruit and vegetable and the different things that we can contemplate about that fruit or vegetable to truly appreciate it before we taste it, all the ways that we can incorporate our standards in understanding our experience of that fruit and vegetable, and now we are going to move on to what other resources are available to you for not only doing taste tests, but also edible gardens and outdoor learning. So our next webinar, we are doing these every Wednesday at the exact same time. Next Wednesday, we are doing planting and caring for a fall garden with children kindergarten through eighth grade. So this webinar will be set up in a way where we will provide all of these different lesson plans for you to prepare a fall garden, either at a school or at your home or at a community park or a community garden. So it's how to prepare it. How do you choose the soil for it? How do you decide how much light there is? But specifically, not for you to decide, but for your children. They are lesson plans for your children to work through these steps to understand how to combine these different soils to make this soil composition and how to follow the light through the sky and see where the shade is cast. We also then have lesson plans for how to plant a garden with small children. So you can see here in the middle, this is a little yoga sequence showing how the kids grow up from a seed and then they'll get to do that same thing with a seed. We also have other lesson plans that we'll be demonstrating for seed tapes and for square foot gardening. And then of course, talk about how to care for our garden as well, how to involve children in weeding and watering and all of those maintenance tasks. The next week on October 14th, we will be doing easy outdoor activities for children K through eight. So again, the same sort of age range. These activities specifically will not have to have a garden. This is for anyone that is going outside with kids, to your front yard, your backyard, the park, going on a walk. We are going to go through some of the mindfulness activities that we can do outside along with lots of easy standards-based scavenger hunts and provide you with those materials, with those scavenger hunt sheets to take outside and talk about these different activities we can do to get kids engaged and interested and curious in the outdoors. Now, after that, we are going to do a webinar on hands-on cooking. So of course, if our students are able to plant a garden, watch a turnip grow, spend time outside, and then harvest their turnip, the next thing that they will want to do is do some hands-on cooking with them. So on that next week, October 21st, we are going to do hands-on cooking and mindful taste tests where we will look at the different tools and tasks that are great for kids to do. And we'll explore even more lesson plans from Turn Up the Volume and some of the recipes from Turn Up the Volume that kids can be involved in. And then the next week we have even more Turn Up the Volume Wednesday webinars. We are going to divide the next week into age range. So a lot of these different um, turn up the volume webinars cover anywhere from kindergarten to eighth grade. And when you sign up for the resources, you'll see that all of our lesson plans are divided by kindergarten through second. Well, we have early care, kindergarten through second, third through fifth, sixth through eighth in high school. So you can get to that targeted age range and get to those standards that match the ones that your students are learning. Now for a lot of these, we have similar concepts that can either be scaled up to eighth grade or scaled down for kindergarten, but we thought it would be nice to have a webinar here at the end that really focused in on our youngest learners, our children two through five, and our oldest learners, our children in grades six through 12. So on that last Wednesday of October, October 28th, from three to four, we'll have that special webinar just for those youngest learners, and then directly following that, we'll have our special webinar just for our oldest learners. All right, so we're getting close to the end of today, and I hope that you were able to experience what a sensory lesson 
might look like for a child with a brand new vegetable, even if they were doing it in a virtual setting. So I'd like to start with the question of when you imagine yourself doing this work with your students, whether it's in a school or a homeschool group or after school or with your own children at home, what questions or concerns pop up? When you're thinking about doing this work, are you thinking like, oh, that's really cute, that would totally work except for this one thing. Or like, oh, you haven't met my one kid, this one thing's gonna happen, it's gonna derail it, I don't think it's gonna work for this reason. Um, what questions or concerns are popping up in your mind when you're imagining going out into the world and doing this work within your sphere with your kids? Type those into the chat box and we'll take a moment to see if we can answer any of those. There's a lot of experience in this room. Um, I am certainly not, I certainly don't have all the answers, but if you have any questions, I bet some of the participants in this room will be able to help. And thank you to our Georgia Organics team for handling some of these logistical questions that we've seen pop up. Um, just so everyone can hear some of the things I've seen come through on the chat. Um, this webinar will be recorded and available to everyone, along with this PowerPoint will be sent out to everyone on PDF. Um, if you sign up for their Turn Up the Volume resources, which we encourage you all to do, all of these lesson plans that I demonstrated today and that I referenced today will all be there available to you. In addition to that, all of the PDFs, all of the printouts, those are all available to you for free. We encourage you to share all of these resources, train the trainer, teach all the teachers you work with, all the homeschool leaders you work with, and share this with as many kids as possible. Oh, and then another logistical question before I get these other two. You do need to register for each individual webinar. They will be each Wednesday, same time, same place, we'll be here, but you will need to register. And I would encourage you to register early. I know that for this one, we had reached capacity before we even started. So I would encourage you to go through and go ahead and register for all of those. All right, some of the questions here, some of the thoughts. Um, Sandra pulled out the idea of finding a way to do the flow of the lesson and only reading a portion of the book. And I love that Sandra mentioned that because when we're talking about engaging education, part of it is using all of these senses, having hands-on things to experience, but a big part of it is pace and flow. And a big part of it is having lots of these different activities to move in and out of quickly and to use multiple modalities so that we can engage all of our students in different ways. So we went from kinesthetic of doing this yoga up and down and twirling around. We could sing songs about the root stems leaves. We were holding on and doing some sensory stuff. We did some linguistic activities with our reading and with our read aloud and our echo reading. And it's that idea of building in that exciting flow that steps from one thing to another, not too fast, but not so slow that we lose that engagement so that students can interact with these vegetables in a way that keeps them with you. Another question um, that we have here is, what if my student is just the pickiest eater you've ever met? And I love this question, because I love that challenge. And I think one of the big takeaways for me and all of the picky eaters that I've been working with has been to shift the mindset away from, we are going to eat this, because it is on the lunch line today and because we want to be in the happy plate club and because you want to be healthy. Shifting from that to something that students understand a little bit better. Healthy, healthy is hard. It's hard for even adults to understand. But if we can shift that to something that students understand better of like, we get to eat this, which is so, we watch this grow from this teeny tiny seed. We watched it for eight weeks growing, we cared for it, and now we get to eat this. And this is going to make our bodies more happy, healthy, loving, and understanding. Isn't that neat? And when it becomes an opportunity to have a very small bite of a risk-free, teeny tiny bite, where they have the opportunity to not like it, that's okay. We're just proud of them for being brave and courageous and trying something new. If you don't like it, it can go to the worms and go right back into the soil to grow us more food. That's great. And building in all of these different ways for students to experience this vegetable in a lot of different ways and to shift from this happy plates, uh, 
club uh, where there's pressure to eat a lot of something that you're not sure if you like compared to, isn't it cool you get to do this? You had one little bite, I am so proud of you. It's all about shifting those attitudes and doing it a lot and presenting a lot of opportunities. So not just one variety of um, turnips, all the varieties of turnips in all the different ways. One of my favorite examples is teaching about carrots. When I'm doing picky eaters, I often do carrots. And with carrots, we will cut them in coins, we'll do them in matchsticks, we'll do them grated, we'll do them boiled, we'll do them steamed, we'll do them roasted. And if you can cut a raw carrot in six different ways, if you can prepare a carrot in another four different ways, if you can get white carrots, purple carrots, and orange carrots, if you can read the book Creepy Carrots, if you can grow a carrot or see one growing, then that is that many opportunities for a child to find a way that they like carrots. So what out of these different 10 ways that we had carrots did you like? What was your favorite? What about it was your favorite? Did you like that it was crunchy? What about it was? That, that's the trick, one of the tricks with picky eaters. But I will also say, they're just hard. <laughs> it is hard, and even as adults, I work with senior citizens in low-income housing every week. I am telling you, even adults that have been on this planet feeding themselves and eating on their own for 70, 80, 90 years, it's hard to try new things. It's hard for me to try new things. It's scary and that's okay. And we can honor those feelings and create an opportunity to be brave and try something brand new all at the same time. All right, we had one more question here. It looks like about where to get these books. I can also create a book list for some of these favorite books that we've included here that the name, the title and the author is in all of the lesson plans on Turn Up the Volume, but we can also create a book list and send you direct links to those when we get there. All right, you will see a poll that just popped up. We'd love to hear before we're done here in our last minute, how are you feeling about using these turn up the volume resources to teach sensory, sensory education with food with your students? From nope, not at all, to I'm getting the hang of this, to I am so ready and can't wait to get started. Let us know how you're feeling about trying these activities with your kids. I have to say, while you're doing this, I am so inspired to see all of you in this workshop and to imagine all of the different kids that each of you guys reach in your position, whether it's the children in your family or all the kids in your larger school. It's amazing to think that every single one of you in the, and there's a lot of people in this webinar, that everyone in this webinar could go out into their own worlds with their own kids and do this work. All of those kids are gonna be so lucky to experience this with you. And I have so much gratitude for each of you for showing up today and learning about these different opportunities for your kids. And I can't wait to hear how it goes and what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Um, we can stick around for a few more minutes if you have any other questions. And otherwise, I'll send it over to Kimberly to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, so yeah, that's all we have for you today. We will be sending everybody here a follow-up email with this month's webinar schedule and a link to register for any and all of those webinars that are upcoming. Um, we also are going to go ahead and right now throw into the chat a link to an evaluation that we would really appreciate if you could do for us very quickly. Um, the info we collect from these evaluation surveys is very important. It is how we get grant funding to do stuff like this. Um, so please take a few minutes to complete that survey for us. And um, we will include that survey link also in the email that we send to you shortly. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us today. Happy Farm to School Month. Uh, we hope to see you next week, same time, same place. See you next week. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate you coming by. Mm -hmm.